I'm going to go ahead and get started. Can you make sure the door is mostly closed? Not all the way because it'll lock. But... <coughs> Thanks. noisy when it opens during the... Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Pellieri, and he is in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering and works in the lab of Brendan Harley, Professor Brendan Harley, um, and he graduated from the University of Florida in 2007 and then worked in industry for a small tissue engineering company for uh, about one year, and um, He's currently a fifth year student, scheduled to finish this spring. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. So, Steven. I just want to start out by uh, thanking Amy for the invitation to give this talk and uh, all of you for coming here to uh, watch my talk. And so I'll be speaking about uh, the development of collagen materials for a variety of different tissue engineering and regenerative medicine applications. And so this is kind of a summary of my work over the last few years. And so the objective of my project has been to engineer materials in order to regenerate spatially defined multi-tissue structures. And so anybody who works in tissue engineering knows that it's difficult enough to try to regenerate or design a material to regenerate a single tissue. Uh, but the reality is in the orthopedic field, a lot of injuries happen at the interface between a soft tissue like tendon, ligament, or cartilage, and then a hard tissue like bone. And so a lot of times, not only is there damage at that interface, but there's also damage with both the soft and the hard tissue. So we need these spatially graded materials to simultaneously regenerate multiple tissues at the same time. And so uh, the paradigm that we follow in our lab is to use, I guess this isn't working, but uh, we use instructive responsive biomaterials and we want to induce spatially ordered multi-phenotype lineage specification of some type of progenitor cell uh, seeded onto this material. And so we have a variety of different properties that we can play around with, uh, with our material. We look at the microstructure. Uh, Certainly for a tissue like tendon or ligament, for example, we know that the alignment of the tissue is going to be important uh, for its mechanical properties. Uh, we can look at the composition, for example, when we're trying to regenerate a tissue like bone, we know it's going to be important to integrate some sort of mineral phase, most likely some calcium phosphate phase uh, as a biomimetic approach. And then finally, we want to integrate uh, biologics into the material, so presentation of biomolecules such as growth factors in order to further drive bioactivity. Okay. Can you guys see that? Barely. <laughs> All right. So uh, the interface that I'm interested in, in particular, is the tendon bone junction, or the TBJ. And so, uh, as you can see here, this is quite a complex interface. We have a relatively compliant tissue and tendon. It's non-mineralized. It's highly lined in one direction. We have bone, which is more amorphous. It contains this mineral phase. And then there's this interface, which is about 100 microns wide in the case of a rotator cuff, for example, which is a common injury site. And so we can see that there's a linear gradient of mineral moving from the tendon to the bone. There's also a significant proteoglycan content in that insertion region, which makes it a lot like cartilage in many ways. And there's also all these different gradients and, and gradations, patterns of different growth factors as well as matrix proteins. So it's a very complex insertion, and, and it's really an elegant solution uh, to, to this mechanical problem, really, of, of joining a tissue like tendon, which is two to three orders of magnitude more compliant than bone. Uh, the issue here is that uh, even though the body does a pretty good job of coming up with joining these two different tissues, it's still a common injury site, and tissue engineers and surgeons really don't have any good solutions for regenerating this interface right now. A lot of times what the surgeon end up, ends up doing is taking the broken end of the tendon and simply trying to suture or sta staple it back into the bone. And so this nice insertion region that the body's come up with, you don't get regeneration of that whatsoever. And so not surprisingly, uh, the failure rates for these types of injuries are very high. For certain types of rotator cuff injuries, as high as 94%. So clearly there's a lot of room for improvement here. And so that's where we'd like to come in, uh, developing biomaterial approaches to this type of problem, and then more broadly using these materials to study how cells interact with their material environment. Uh, 
And so looking at some of the design rules that we're interested in uh, for the TBJ specifically, again, uh, ideally we'd like to have a single spatially patterned material where we could put a single progenitor cell type like a mesenchymal stem cell and then using a spatially ordered set of instructive cues uh, promote multi-lineage specification on a single material. Uh, looking compartment by compartment, uh, tendon is one that uh, we're not, most people aren't familiar with uh, compared to the insertion in the chondrogenic type of region or the bone osteogenic region. Uh, so this, this one's a little more tricky as far as driving MSC tenogenic differentiation, but what we do know from the literature is that uh, cells within the tendon are highly aligned and they're elongated. And uh, we know that when you take a microfabricate sub substrate, like shown here, and you really can find the cells and make them stretch and elongate. Uh, that promotes a more tenogenic like phenotype. So that's something we'd like to be able to do with our material. Uh, in the insertion region, again, we're going for more of a chondrogenic phenotype. And we know from the literature that cell condensation, increased cell-cell contacts uh, can promote chondrogenesis. And then finally, in the bone phase, uh, we know that by incorporating some uh, type of mineral content or mineral phase, not only can we strengthen the material, but we can also uh, promote the presentation and the release during remodeling of calcium and phosphate groups, for example, which we know promote osteogenesis. <clears throat> so the material that we use in our lab primarily is the collagen glycosamine glycan, or CG scaffold. So these scaffolds are regulatory compliant materials. Uh, they've been around for about 30 years. Uh, the prototypical CG material is this material on the left here, the integradermal regeneration template. Uh, so this has been around, like I said, for about 30 years. It's been in the clinic for uh, about 20 years, I think. Uh, it's FDA approved. It's been implanted into about 100,000 uh, patients, primarily burn victims, people like that. Uh, on the other side here is a more contemporary version of our CG scaffold. So this is actually a multi-compartment scaffold that was uh, initiated uh, through a company, Orthomimetics, that was co-founded by my boss, Brendan Harley, as well as some of his colleagues. And this scaffold had two compartments in it, one to treat articular cartilage and then the other to treat subchondral bone. So these are osteochondral injuries that it was targeting, and that's currently in state from clinical trials. <clears throat> so these scaffolds are fabricated by freeze drying, and typically we take a suspension of collagen, so usually type 1 collagen, mix up with some kind of gag, usually chondroitin sulfate and a weak acid. And we mix it up, we homogenize it, and then we freeze dry it. So the freezing process is controlled by the temperature of this freeze dryer shell, for example, and also the properties of the mold that we hold the suspension in. And by controlling that freezing process, we can control the size and the shape of the ice crystals that form within the suspension. So following sublimation of those ice crystals from the material, you end up with a dry, sponge-like material. Uh, it's highly porous. And from there, you can hydrate it. You can put cells on it. Uh, you can incorporate different growth factors and things like that. And I'll talk about that uh, later on in the talk. <coughs> so uh, kind of the, the outline for how this talk's going to go, uh, we're going to start out with the material design, looking first at how we design materials uh, strictly for tendon regeneration. Uh, since this is mechanical engineering uh, seminar, I'll talk a little bit about composite design for improving the mechanical integrity of these materials. Uh, next, I'll start to talk about incorporating uh, various biologic cues into the scaffold, various sol sol uh, soluble factor supplementation strategies that we've come up with. I'll talk a little bit about how those material and biological cues come together to regulate uh, directed MSC differentiation. And then we'll bring it all together to talk about how we can integrate all this information into a single material uh, for TBGA regeneration. Uh, so starting off with fabricating these biomimetic scaffolds, I'll talk about how we actually make these scaffolds. We want scaffolds that are highly aligned to mimic the aligned nature of tendon. And I'll talk about the dual role of microstructural anisotropy as well as scaffold relative density on regulating uh, tendon cell or tenocyte bioactivity. <clears throat> Uh, so the approach that we take to make aligned scaffolds is a twist on that uh, regular freeze drying uh, paradigm that I showed a couple slides ago. And the idea here is to mo promote directional solidification of the suspension during the freeze drying. And what we use is this thermally mismatched mold shown here, where we have the Teflon body 
and then a thin copper plate as the base. And there's holes drilled in this body where we can fill with suspension, so we end up with these little cylindrical scaffolds. Uh, we usually make them on the order of six to eight millimeters in diameter, uh, 15 to 30 millimeters in length. So we can make them fairly large, and we can also go much smaller than that uh, for small animal applications, for example. Uh, but the idea is that since the copper is so much more conductive than the Teflon, essentially all the heat transfer is happening through this copper base during freezing. And so you can imagine that as ice crystals start to form on this bottom plate, and ice crystals aggregate during the freezing, they're going to stretch and elongate along this axis. So when you look at a longitudinal slice of the scaffold, the pores are highly aligned, uh, but in a transverse slice, the pores around are more isotropic. And so by controlling the freezing temperature, for example, we can control the pore size, the final pore size, so lower freezing temperatures lead to smaller pores. And so uh, for this particular study, we looked at a range from about 50 to 250 microns. And just to give you an idea, uh, tenocytes, when they're stretched out in, in a native tendon, usually get to about 125 microns. So they can stretch out quite a bit, uh, but we have a nice range of pore sizes that get you know, smaller as well as larger than the cell size. And so just to quickly summarize some initial results that we got uh, from these, this set of scaffolds, we were able to show that cells proliferated, uh, you know, they attached well, they did all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we wanted to look more closely at whether they were acting like healthy tenocyte uh, should. And so we looked at a variety of different gene targets. And I'll be talking a lot about these in the next few slides. So I figured I'd give a summary of some of the targets we're interested in especially since uh, tendon is maybe a, a more unfamiliar tissue for a lot of people. So uh, looking at first at some structural proteins, tendon is composed primarily of type 1 collagen. Uh, type 3 collagen is also an important component, especially in immature tendon. Uh, comp and decrin are important uh, in, are important but minor components of, of the tendon. Uh, they promote collagen for biogenesis, for example, uh, during remodeling as well as development. As far as phenotype markers, it's, this is a little tricky for tendon, but we found that scleraxis is a very good marker. A tenacity C is also pretty good as well. And then we looked at a few different MMPs uh, as measures of remodeling uh, during our culture. <coughs> and so uh, one of the first experiments we did is we looked at scaffolds that had a significant or a consistent uh, amount of pore alignment, also a consistent pore size, about 200 and 250 microns, but we varied the relative density of the scaffold. So we varied the amount of collagen and gag that was in the final scaffold. And what we found is that uh, for the materials that didn't have a lot of collagen in them, the low density materials, they actually were not able to withstand the contractile forces exerted by the cells. And so the pores collapsed, the material basically shrunk into a little ball. And uh, that was obviously bad for a lot of reasons. One of the cells started to die. We got these aggregations of cells uh, out on the outer edge. You can see that even though these two materials start with the same pore size, the pores here have essentially collapsed. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, we lost this uh, anisotrop anisotropic cues within the scaffold, so the pores are no longer aligned. And you can see that when we look at cell alignment, now within the higher density scaffolds, we see nice alignment, and we got these numbers from histology slides like this. So uh, nice alignment in the higher density scaffold, but really random orientation of the cells in the lower density scaffold. And that manifested itself uh, in some of the phenotype markers, such as chloraxis, where we could actually track temporally how the scaffolds contracted, how they lost those anisotropic cues over time. And that tracked pretty nicely with the down regulation of this tendon marker's chloraxis, while the higher density scaffold was able to maintain uh, a nice high level. So bottom line is this higher MC scaffold that maintains its pore structure, maintains its pore alignment, uh, promotes a more healthy tenogenic like phenotype. <clears throat> and this is just another example of some more uh, gene targets that we looked at. Uh, this was the one I showed on the previous slide just for the final time point. So this is all after 14 days in culture. And you can see this is how we would like things to trend. Uh, for these particular targets, and you can see that trends pretty nicely with relative density. So again, the denser scaffolds uh, are performing uh, better. And so as I mentioned, one of the issues with uh, some of our initial scaffold prototypes, and, and really an issue with these collagen type of materials in general, is that they've been applied primarily to soft tissue applications in the past. Uh, but we, we need ways to improve the mechanical integrity for these orthopedic applications like tendon. And so uh, I'll talk a little bit about this composite approach, uh, core shell design that we came up with. 
I'll talk about how we can play around with these different membrane shells that we use to strengthen the composite. And I'll talk about some cell results just to confirm that uh, incorporation of the shell didn't uh, harm the bioactivity of the material. And so, uh, really, there's some typical trade-offs when you're designing a scaffold. Uh, you know, certainly with our CG scaffolds, or really any type of scaffold that you're going to run into. Uh, when we look at the relative density of the material, we know that by increasing that, we can increase the elastic modulus uh, quite a bit. But at the same time, we're going to be decreasing the porosity. We're decreasing the permeability. So basically, it's going to make it harder for cells to infiltrate the material, harder for them to stay alive, uh, and har harder for them to gain, you know, get adequate levels of nutrients, oxygen, things like that. And so there's always going to be a trade-off. And what tissue engineers have come up with in the past is to use these electrospun mats um, when they're trying to do tendon tissue engineering in particular. And so these are pretty nice because they're high strength materials, uh, but they do have some drawbacks. They're essentially two dimensional, and so there's a limited cell penetration. A lot of times you'll just get a layer of cells on the outer edge here and, and really no infiltration of the cells, so kind of like a cell sheet, uh, which, which is not very good when you're trying to regenerate a three dimensional material. And so, uh, Nature's solution to this type of problem where you need a material that's going to be lightweight and porous but still very strong is a coarse shell composite. And so uh, this is a cross section of a porcupine quill right here. And this is a cross section of uh, some copper tubing. But really, the, uh, the result is the same. You have this highly porous, low density core surrounded by a dense shell. So you see this type of uh, setup in plant stems also where you need a highly porous core in order to promote water and nutrient transport. But at the same time, you won't, don't want that material to buckle. And so uh, that outer shell gives it some nice mechanical integrity. And so we figured we could do the same thing with our materials. And so our approach was to take this, uh, this scaffold core that I just talked about uh, on the previous slides and integrate a membrane shell into the scaffold. And so the way we made these membranes is by instead of uh, freeze drying our starting suspension, we just let it evaporate. And so we end up with this very dense uh, collagen material, has a relative density of about 75% compared to our scaffold, which is one or 2%. So it's much, much denser, uh, much, much stronger, as you might imagine. And the way we incorporated that shell uh, into our material was we took, uh, we made the membrane first, and then we put it into that Teflon copper mold, added it into the suspension, and then freeze dried it. And so. By letting the suspension hydrate the membrane prior to freezing, uh, we were able to incorporate uh, the core into the membrane. And uh, one of the nice things about these membranes is that we can also make them with uh, perforations or pores if we want. And so this is just using simple microfabrication techniques uh, in order to make these uh, membranes with uh, periodic perforations, for example. So this would be to promote uh, cell infiltration from the sides of the scaffold, for example, a better permeability. Uh, but of course, there's a trade off here too, right? If you start taking out too much material, then uh, there's really no point for the membrane. And so uh, most of the studies that we've done have been with just the regular membrane uh, without the pores. So uh, just some characterization of this membrane. Uh, we were able to make membranes from a range of about 20 to 250 microns, and we were able to modulate that just by adding different amounts of starting suspension. Uh, we can also uh, tune the modulus of the membrane uh, by cross-linking using carbidiamide chemistry. And so that's the same type of chemistry that we use to normally cross-link our collagen scaffolds. Now, when we looked at the composite structure, we can see that there's nice integration of the membrane uh, with the scaffold. And uh, we, it turns out that we were actually able to uh, fairly predictably uh, look, at the, uh, look at the core shell modulus as a function of CG membrane thickness. And so when we incorporated shells of different thickness, we could predict what the modulus was going to be uh, based on layered composites theory. And so we were able to get uh, moduli of around uh, 8 megapascals for this uh, thicker uh, scaffold, which was an uh, increase over the bare scaffold by about a factor of 36. Uh, finally, we looked at cell viability, and so uh, we wanted to see, okay, this membrane certainly is going to cut down on the permeability of our constructs, uh, but how is that going to affect cell viability? And it turns out it doesn't really affect it uh, all that much. You can see after 14 days, there's no significant differences in cell number or metabolic activity, and we think one of the reasons for that is that the membrane helps hold in cells initially. You can see actually there's a higher cell number uh, with the membrane uh, scaffold initially. 
And we think the reason for that is with these dry scaffolds, uh, you can imagine it's a little harder to seed cells on them compared to uh, encapsulating cells in hydrogel, for example. That's not going to be as efficient. And so what the membrane does is it helps holes in uh, that cell solution initially, helps and promote a more efficient seeding. And we think that helps out uh, down the road here. <coughs> All right, so uh, now we move on to talking about some uh, different soluble factor uh, supplementation strategies that we try to incorporate. And I'll talk first about you know, just uh, putting growth factors into our uh, media, basically just having factors freely soluble uh, in conjunction with our scaffolds. I'll talk about ways to, <coughs> to uh, immobilize uh, biomolecules within our scaffold, and then I'll talk about ways to actually spatially pattern or mobilize uh, biomolecules uh, within these scaffolds. And so starting out, we looked at a variety of different factors. Uh, PDGF, IGF, we knew were going to be important for proliferation, uh, cell recruitment, things like that. Uh, BFGF and HDF5 were going to be more important for phenotype. And then we also looked at SDF1 alpha uh, as a chemoattractant for encouraging tenocyte and MSC uh, chemotaxis into our scaffolds. So looking first at cell infiltration, what we did uh, as a little in vitro study, uh, we were looking at uh, a modified transwell membrane assay where we had our scaffold in this bottom compartment. Uh, we had cells seated on top of a porous membrane and we wanted to see how many cells would migrate into the scaffold uh, towards a gradient of one of these factors. So we had a single dose of one of these factors uh, in the bottom compartment with the scaffold. And what we were able to show is that uh, the PDGF and IGF groups uh, seem to be the best as far as uh, promoting chemotaxis. And it turns out that uh, those factors were really the best uh, in some of the longer term experiments we did also, uh, looking at cell proliferation, for example. Uh, but uh, what we also found from those experiments is that uh, while those factors promoted proliferation, we were also seeing a lower collagen production on a per cell basis. And so when we looked at uh, some of the gene expression results from these studies, that started to make sense. So PDGF we thought was uh, <coughs> producing less collagen on a per cell basis. And sure enough, when we looked at the expression of the type 1 collagen gene, we saw a dose dependent decrease in the PDGF groups. We saw the same thing uh, with our phenotype marker scleraxis. So while we're getting more cells, they were producing less collagen on a per cell basis, and they were also acting less like healthy tendon cells. Uh, in contrast, some of these factors that didn't have much of an effect on uh, collagen or much of an effect on proliferation, recruitment, or collagen production, we saw uh, increases in phenotype markers. And so some of these factors are promoting phenotype, some of these factors are promoting proliferation. And so the next logical step would be to look at uh, combinations of these factors. And so that's what we did, looking at either PDGF or IGF with either GFGF or GDF5. So one of these proliferation factors uh, with one of the phenotype factors. And what we were able to find is that uh, all these combinations did a nice job of increasing uh, proliferation and also uh, increasing collagen production. Uh, in particular, this IGF1, GDF5 group had a significantly higher amount of collagen produced compared to the other groups, uh, despite having less cells uh, than the PDGF groups over here, uh, for example. And when we looked at the gene expression results, uh, that made a lot of sense because we saw an upregulation in type 1 collagen as well as significant upregulations in some of the other markers we're interested in, uh, such as comp and scleraxis. Uh, so it seems like that combination is really uh, the best as far as promoting a tenogenic like phenotype. Uh, but all of this work was done uh, with just uh, adding freely soluble factors into the culture media. Uh, we want a way to make this more amenable to in vivo and clinical translation. We want ways to incorporate these biomolecules directly into the scaffold. And uh, there's, there's important reasons for those. We know that biomolecules are, are natively sequestered in the ECM. Uh, we know that uh, that extends the half-life. We get a more localized effect. Uh, there's also a potential for cells to uh, sample these immobilized factors multiple times without uptaking the factor. And so uh, there's lots of advantages to doing more of an immobilized or sequestered uh, presentation of these uh, factors within our scaffold. So we look first at just doing bulk immobilization. Uh, again, we use carbodiamid chemistry here, uh, the sink, our cross-linking chemistry that we use with these scaffolds anyway as a way to uh, covalently 
bind these uh, factors into our scaffold. And all I'm showing here is uh, just some gene expression results on the top showing that when we immobilized equivalent doses of these factors uh, compared to the soluble dose, we saw a lot of the same trends. Uh, when we looked at cell proliferation with a single soluble versus mobilized dose of PDGF, we saw a more sustained effect from the immobilized group, uh, for example. And so this tells us that these soluble factors retain at least some measure of long-term activity uh, once they're immobilized within, within the scaffolds. Uh, but what about patterning? So, uh, you know, going back to this whole idea of trying to get a spatially graded material, it'd be really nice to be able to pattern uh, these factors in different areas of the scaffold. And so in order to do that, uh, we talked to Ryan Bailey's group in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, they'd come up with a, a benzophenone photochemical approach in order to pattern biomolecules within uh, two-dimensional materials. And so this is just a summary of the benzophenone chemistry. You can take this benzophenone group, radiate it with UV light, uh, form a transient diradical that can then abstract the hydrogen uh, from, from any surrounding CH bond. This is a very molecularly uh, general approach. All you need is a CH bond. And the nice thing is that this radical is going to relax if there's no insertion, which means that uh, when that radical relaxes back to its ground state, it can be re-excited uh, in the presence of a different biomolecule through a different photomask. And so you can do overlapping patterns of multiple biomolecules on a single substrate. And so uh, we knew uh, from some of their previous work that it would work in 2D, for example. So this is a, a glass slide functionalized with benzophenone exposed to this red model protein, selectively irradiated. And so you're immobilizing the red protein only in certain areas. Uh, you then wash the protein off, uh, immerse it in this green model protein, radiate through a different photo mask, and so you get these overlapping patterns of the two components. You thought it would be really cool if that would work in, in 3D, in our 3D scaffolds. And so uh, just to make a long story short, uh, it turns out that it did. And so uh, I don't know how well you can see some of these patterns, but. Uh, we can get stripes, uh, multi-component stripes, different gradients, and even goofy shapes that really don't have uh, much real application, but this kind of shows how uh, the versatility of the method and, and the, the resolution also. Uh, these stripes are on the order of 100 microns, uh, for example. All right, so now we have uh, talked a little bit about some of the material cues that we can integrate into the scaffold, how we can integrate different levels of biologics. And so I want to go back to this idea of trying to get uh, a single material in order to induce multi-lineage lineage specification of a stem cell fate, for example. And we thought, you know, before we jumped straight to doing this all on a single material, we wanted to go uh, to the individual compartments and try to optimize those and then bring it all into a single material. So I've talked a lot about the tendon compartment already, about how uh, by incorporating some type of anisotropy in the material in order to induce cell alignment and cell stretching, uh, that can promote more tenogenic phenotype. Uh, in the insertion region, we want to modulate the relative density of the scaffold, promote cell condensation and chondrogenesis, hopefully. And then in the bone compartment, we want to incorporate, incorporate a mineral phase into our scaffold. And then, of course, with all these uh, different phenotypes, uh, some combination of biomolecule presentation uh, is going to be probably the best approach in order to do this. And so I'll just go through these one by one, uh, starting with the tendon compartment. So now we're working with these uh, MSCs. Uh, and what we showed initially is that uh, just with having aligned scaffolds, we were able to see nice upregulation of chloraxis uh, long term. When we incorporate these growth factors, we really don't see much of uh, a synergistic effect. When we look at some of our other markers, like tenacin C, uh, here there's really no effect of the scaffold anisotropy, but then we see upregulation of this factor uh, when we supplement with uh, some of these growth factors. So that shows that you know, for some factors, Maybe it's important to have scaffold anisotropy. For others, it's going to be important to get the right biomolecule combination. So really, the combination of scaffold anisotropy and soluble factor supplementation is important. Uh, we also did another experiment to look at uh, you know, if we took away the cell's ability to feel whether it was in an isotropic or anisotropic scaffold, for example, how is that going to affect things? And so we added in bloody statin myosin 2 inhibitor uh, in order to inhibit the ability of these cells to actually stretch and elongate uh, within the scaffold. And so uh, in theory, uh, an isotropic versus an anisotropic scaffold should be the same 
uh, to those cells uh, when they're treated. And you can see the cells really aren't stretching out or elongating at all uh, compared to the way they normally do uh, within these scaffolds. And here we saw downregulation of uh, one of our markers that we're interested in, tenacin C. Here, for example, uh, really no differences between the isotropic and the anisotropic groups. Looking at that insertion zone, uh, the take home message here is that uh, a lower density scaffold that promoted contraction and cell condensation in, combina in combination with a, <coughs> a standard uh, contragenic media was able to promote the most contragenic response. Uh, uh, measured here by a uh, type 2 collagen expression. Yeah, growth factors didn't seem to have much of an effect uh, in this case. Uh, moving on to the osteogenic compartment, uh, we first showed by uh, simply incorporating a mineral phase into our CG scaffold, we were able to promote upregulation of a couple of different bone markers here, uh, bone cyaloprotein as well as osteocalcin. Uh, further supplementation with either DMP2 or standard osteogenic supplements uh, not unexpectedly was able to promote even a, a higher increase in some of these markers. This is looking at ALP activity, for example, uh, where really the combination of a mineralized scaffold with osteogenic supplements uh, got us the best results. So now we've gone through these lineages, and uh, the question though is how are we going to integrate this all into a single material? And so uh, if you remember back to one of my first slides where I talked about that scaffold uh, that we had developed for osteochondral repair, that used a layering approach in order to get two distinct compartments to regenerate two different tissues. So we thought we could do that uh, or use a similar approach for the TBJ. And so what we did was actually uh, it's a lot like a, a black and tan. And so you can imagine, uh, we start out with these collagen gag suspensions. Uh, we can start out with two different suspensions, one that's gonna become this tendon compartment, one that's gonna become the bone compartment. Carefully layer them on top of one another, let them interfuse for a set amount of time, and then freeze dry. And so the freezing blocks this diffusion gradient in place. And so what you end up with is a material that has these distinct regions of mineral content uh, but then when you look at the interface through SCM, you can see a continuity of the collagen fibers. And this is important because we don't want the two different materials to delaminate. You know, that's, that's part of the problem that you would get uh, during normal repair of the TPJ, for example, where you lose that gradient insertion zone. And so we get a nice gradient of mineral content, as I'll show you on the next slide. But uh, importantly, we get continuity of the collagen fibers, so uh, these compartments stay together. So by combining this layering approach, with uh, some of our uh, previous work with directional solidification, what we get is not only these distinct regions of mineral content, we also get distinct regions of pore anisotropy. And so the pores in the tendon compartment actually end up being significantly more aligned than in the bone compartment. And again, that's important because tendon is aligned while bone is more amorphous. And then through micro CT, we could actually quantify uh, the mineral content uh, throughout the length of the scaffold, and we can see a nice linear gradient moving from uh, tendon to bone. All right, so uh, just to wrap things up, I thought I'd include some bonus slides, uh, some bioreactor work that we've been doing recently. Again, I uh, think it might be a little more interesting for, for this type of crowd. So uh, we know that mechanical stimulation and mechanical regulation of cell behavior is going to be important, uh, really for most any tissue, but especially orthopedic tissues like tendon and bone. And so uh, we're playing around with some really simple bioreactors right now. This is, this is one that we actually built in the lab that was probably about as simple as you can get. We've also been working with Marty Bopart's group to uh, do some work on uh, flex cell machines. But I'll show you uh, something that we actually an undergrad built. Uh, it was kind of goofy. But uh, so we have it hooked up to the standard power supply. Got your $8 hobby shop uh, pulley system here. And you can't see that very well. We just have scaffolds clamped in there. And it's just uniaxial tension uh, running on a vacation timer, I think, so that you could do intermittent stretch. Very simple, but uh, we could still get some pretty decent results from it. And you can see that the cells, when there's no stretch, uh, they stretch out a little bit, but they're kind of randomly oriented compared to the cells that are stretched out. They're highly elongated. And you can see there's some preference. So the stretch direction was uh, horizontal plane here. And then when we look at some of the gene expression results, we can see that uh, some of our markers that we're interested in, scleraxis and tenacin C, for example, are upregulated. Um, when we stimulate these multi-compartment scaffolds, we can start to look at things like collagen organization, for example. 
And so I'm showing uh, collagen in green and then actin in red. And I don't, probably can't see that very well, but uh, so the scale bar is 50 microns, by the way. So we have our CG, or our, or our tendon compartment, uh, on the left side here, with or without stretch, compared to our mineral compartment uh, with stretch and without stretch. And so you can see that the, <coughs> the collagen seems to be more uh, compact uh, in the mineral compartment compared to the, the uh, non-mineral compartment where uh, the collagen is, is, seems like it's more organized with the stretch and also more uh, elongated. And so uh, this is ongoing work that we're looking at, uh, but we're starting to get to the point where we're integrating cells into this multi-compartment material and really seeing uh, what happens. So just to wrap things up, uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, for at least tendon the combination of microstructural and isotropy, uh, density, relative density, and also contraction mediated remodeling is important for maintaining or regulating cell bioactivity. Uh, we can also include various forms of biochemical supplementation in order to drive uh, cell phenotype and bioactivity. Mineral content is important, uh, being able to incorporate mineral content into the scaffold. Uh, drive osteogenesis uh, has worked pretty nicely. Uh, looking at spatially and also temporally controlled biomolecule uh, sequestration and release is a big push in our lab right now. It's ongoing work. And uh, also some of the mechanical stimulation stuff that I showed you is, is really a big push right now in the group. Um, finally, all the work that I've shown you so far has been in vitro. And so uh, we're trying to get into animal models uh, sooner rather than later. And probably not going to jump straight to a pig right away. Uh, we're working on some smaller animal models, uh, like a mouse model, for example. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, everybody in the lab. Uh, Dan did a lot of the work with uh, the mineral scaffolds. Uh, Doug and Manny are two talented undergrads that uh, really helped out a lot. Manny, in particular, with the membrane and the core shell composite design. Uh, Doug with a little bit of everything, including the bioreactor. Uh, Teresa is a, uh, was a, student, a grad student in Ryan Bailey's group. Uh, that helped initialize that benzophenone patterning project uh, along with me. And uh, Ziad is Mar Marnie's student, and he's been helping out with a lot of flex cell uh, bioreactor kind of stuff. And finally, just uh, acknowledge my committee, my boss, Brendan, uh, Ryan, and the rest of the committee, as well as CBI and funding sources. Uh, so thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. It's tough. It's tough. Uh, but what we did is we make the membrane, or we made the membrane first. And what we did is we actually kind of rolled it up and put it into that, uh, that Teflon copper mold that I showed earlier. And so by adding in the suspension while it's still in liquid form and letting it hydrate the membrane, letting it incorporate itself into the membrane, uh, that's by kind of tuning that time, we could get different, uh, different levels of incorporation of the scaffold core into the membrane. And so if you don't wait long enough, then, then yeah, then the core is going to delaminate from the membrane. Uh, but if you wait long enough and you let it adequately hydrate the membrane, the freezing process seems to do a nice job of integrating uh, the two components together. So did you overlap the membrane with itself, you know, like, like this? Or did you have it just butted up against? We usually did a little bit of overlap. For some of the models, we actually did a, a double wrap. And what we were able to show is that, you know, sometimes it would delaminate a little bit, but for the most part, uh, when we were doing mechanical tests and things like that, it was behaving like a true layer composite. And so we figured that it was, it was getting the job done. And I can imagine that, you know, in a surgical setting, it might be a lot easier to just try to put the scaffold in and then kind of go in there with the membrane and kind of wrap it around. And I know that the people actually do that for, I know, bone, and I don't know if anybody's done it for tendon, but. Uh, maybe using the membrane as a wrap instead of trying to incorporate it into the material uh, is an avenue for, for success, but that's something we haven't tried yet, but hopefully soon with the, the animal models. And what was the size of the, the wells that you put the membrane in, in the solution? <laughs> so we typically make the scaffolds uh, from diameter about six to eight millimeters. Uh, the length is about 15 to 30 millimeters. So we make them fairly large. Uh, well, we, we've made them smaller than that. Uh, we, were, we did a nerve study with uh, a collaborator over in California where we had to make them about uh, one millimeter in diameter. And we were able to do that. And we still saw a nice alignment of the pores and 
Oh, all right. We're not, not, not with the wrap in that case, yeah. Yeah, that, that gets a little tougher. But the wrap itself is, is on the order of usually uh, 20 to 100 microns, and we can tune that uh, fairly precisely. Other questions? I have one more question. Okay. Um, you showed the, I think it was the previous slide, you had the membranes with the holes in them, mm -hmm. and you showed that you were testing that tension, is that right? So, oh, this one right here. Oh, yeah, this cartoon here. Was it tension or compression? And how did you prove the sample? Okay. So, we haven't actually done. We haven't done mechanical tests of the porous membranes yet. Okay. And so that was more just to show that we could do it. We haven't done a whole lot with them yet. All the results that I showed were with the composites uh, with the membrane without the holes. But yeah, all, all the mechanical tests that I showed were, were in tension. So how do you, how do you grip the cylinder? So usually what, what we've tried to do, and I know Laura has been working with, with Mike to try to, to get better results from, uh, from that process, but uh, we were using Kong's mechanical tester, and we, we had got some special rubber grips that seemed to do a pretty decent job of gripping some of these softer biological samples like we use. And, and you know, we got okay results, but I, I think there's certainly room for improvement. I think that's, that's what Laura's trying to do with your group. <laughs> so far. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we definitely had a lot of samples that, you know, would, would slip and would not work out, so. That was a little bit of an issue, but that's that's something we're working on. But they were still in the Yes. Other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again.